My name is Dan and we are in the Francis Collins lab in the NHGRI NIH Bethesda campus. I'm a computer programmer. I write machine learning algorithms. Machine learning is a subfield of computer science and artificial intelligence. So do you know Skynet? I have nothing to do with that. It's all about data mining. Biologists are always in need of new data mining programs. What essentially a lot of these algorithms do is they can classify whether something is a disease state or a non-disease state. And it also tell you how much variation there is. So maybe you want to figure out how much of your height can be attributed to your genes. It first began in my freshman year of undergrad when I have a great professor who realized my potential as an applied mathematician and spent three days a week in a Starbucks with me teaching me advanced linear algebra. That motivated me to just uh, get into research. I also read Francis Collins' The Language of God. And after spending two years in the University of California, Irvine, doing my PhD in computer science, doing genomics research, I finally had an opportunity to meet Dr. Collins himself and do a summer internship in his lab. The one thing that really excites me about what I'm doing is, it's just that it's so new and that it's so interdisciplinary. I really can't think of too many people in the world who are doing what we're doing or even what I'm doing at the moment because these, these are new technologies that are being made all the time. Biologists need newer and newer and faster programs to do what they're doing. Hey, Dan. In the long term, what we would like to do is to understand how the genome works and how it functions to the point where we could just treat the cell like a car. We can take it apart and build it back together, know it like the back of our hand. It's what I enjoy the most. It's very, it's, it's very relaxing, um, but not too relaxing. I do have to report to my superiors every day. Uh, I also have to make sure I generate results and draw some very valid conclusions. Uh, I ran the Wellington footprinting algorithm on the ATAC seq data and found about a million footprints. Sometimes it involves me writing a new program for whatever the biologists need at the moment. And sometimes it means helping the biologists understand how to use my programs. You know, um, these, are not, these are nine cell types that we have available motif. Okay. I actually get to meet a lot of great people. I have made some very great friends here. <laughs> I'm constantly meeting them over and over again, whether they're in Washington, D.C. or Maryland. Have fun with what you're doing. Life isn't very fun if you're not actually enjoying what you're doing. And two, if you're going to fail, fail with style. Science is all about constantly failing and rebuilding yourself and learning from your mistakes. So you're living on the edge, basically. Oh, yeah. Right on the edge. <laughs> oh yeah, the edge of glory. <laughs>
I look at immune responses after vaccinations against HIV. My great-great-grandfather back in Ireland taught science, so it's kind of been in the family, but I'm the first one in the family to actually get into science. When I was in a roughly third grade, uh, we used to have newsreels, um, and at, in 1983, they were announcing a new disease that was affecting a population in San Francisco. At first, it seemed to strike only one segment of the population. Now, Barry Peterson tells us this is no longer the case. There is a one in five chance a victim will die within the first year of the illness, a disease experts are now calling a national epidemic and it was really interesting because it was a viral disease where the virus knew to attack the immune system to keep itself alive and it just absolutely fascinated me and ever since then I just kind of got into doing science and biology and anything that was going on for treatments. I emailed a particular lab that was doing HIV research that was really fascinating. I emailed said I was interested in doing that and they took me on and I've been with them for the past 15 years. We are working towards a goal. We're, looking, we're, we're working towards getting a vaccine to HIV. And HIV is a very complex virus. It likes to mutate itself to evade the immune system as much as possible, but the biggest thing is to determine if the vaccines that we have out there now are going to be even helpful. It is baby steps. And so I usually get samples from patients who either have the disease or they were a volunteer in our vaccine trials. And we look at the immune response that happens during the disease or after the vaccine response and decide, is it the kind of immune response that could be helpful? So I do a lot of work in what's known as flow cytometry, where we take immune cells and we label them with fluorescent antibodies. And then we look at what each one of them does. So you can see the spray of cells right here, which is showing that those cells are actually responding to the antigens um, of the vaccine, and it's showing that these cells are actually doing some, some good work. So we can look at both blood, lymph nodes, and every different kind of tissues in the, in the human body. You've got a 96 well plate, and your samples are in there, stained and ready to go. Then after it picks up the sample, it injects it into this device, which then moves it into the larger device. Inside are lasers that are shooting at each individual cell and looking at the fluorescence of each individual cell. And that is being translated and then recorded by the software. Everybody here, at least in, the, in, in this lab and in this building, we work with each other. So what you guys do this weekend? We're constantly talking to each other, sharing ideas. And if we don't have the expertise, we will reach out to anybody else at the NIH. We work so closely together and we do a lot of hard work. The technology that we're developing is helping us get faster and faster coming to a vaccine goal. I would say we're about halfway there, and hopefully in the next 15 years we have something that's even better. Just don't give up. If, it's, if this is something that you love, just keep going with it. It's, it's, I love it every day. I've been doing it for a good 17 years, and I still, I still love coming in every day, doing stuff at the bench, getting the results, and seeing what happens.
My name is Pareshma Patel. Um, I actually go by Pinky. And right now we're in the labs at NCATS in a chemistry lab in Rockville, Maryland. So I'm actually working on a disease right now. We're developing some molecules that could be of interest for fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, which is a rare genetic disease. I would say growing up, I've honestly wanted to be everything from an artist to a lawyer to a doctor. So um, I've had a, a breadth of interest um, over when I was growing up. I really did not enjoy my first chemistry class. It was a huge class. It was called, it was General Chemistry 1. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. There were 250 students. And the professor just put up transparency after transparency of chemical equations. And I just couldn't understand how I would ever use this stuff. And I spent some time at a small pharmaceutical company. and. It was that time where I actually was involved in drug discovery and medicinal chemistry and applying organic chemistry to, to making molecules that were useful to medicine and to solving biological problems. You know, I only spent a little bit of time doing that, but that's how I knew I really liked this application of organic chemistry to medicine, and that's what I wanted to do. You do hear a lot of uh, adages about don't trust a chemist that can't cook, because a lot of what we do is so similar. First, you have to have an idea of what you're gonna make. You read a recipe to decide how you're gonna make it. You gather kind of all the ingredients that you're gonna need, and you mix them together, and, and you make your end product. So similarly, with chemistry, it's, it's, it's a similar path. So I start off by designing an experiment, making a really specific molecule that I'm interested in. And so in order to do that, I have to do research and read a procedure in the literature. And based on what that procedure says, I actually gather all the, the starting chemicals that I'll need. And as chemists, we spend a lot of times actually going through this mixture that we have in a flask and trying to separate the things we want from the things we don't want. And then once we've done that, either it could be a home run and you know it worked the first time, or it could be a procedure that needs modification. So I might need to change and tweak a few things so I can do it again. Or I might just have to move on to something else. And in the end, we spend a lot of times trying to figure out if we made what we wanted to make, whether we can make use of what we have. Sometimes when we run chemist, we're running chemical reactions, we need these reactions to actually be very cold. And so when you make a bath of dry ice, and in this case we're using acetone as the solvent, it actually cools the flask to minus 78 degrees. And so that allows us to run reactions under very cold temperatures. And a lot of chemical reactions, you have to keep the reaction very cold so that the chemicals that you're using don't decompose um, while you're running your reaction. So in this case, I'm just cooling down my flask before I add the chemicals to actually run the reaction. It, it's those small, small steps of, of when I kind of have an idea that I hadn't had before or where something really works that keeps me going and, and to be able to build upon that. If you're making an, an antibiotic compound, for example, just testing it to see whether it kills bacteria, those are short-term term effects that you learn from and you actually can develop into something more interesting down the line. For me, it would be exciting for it to be something that affects patients in the end. I'm actually somebody who is a people person. <laughs> I think science is much more useful if you're interactive with people. Are you drawing the starring, quinoline starring material? Maybe, maybe we can start with this quinoline and then we can do a displacement maybe with an aniline. There's a lot out there and the more you're communicating with people. I don't know if this is gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the whole purpose. The better you're, of a scientist you're gonna be. Science is a career where there are a lot of times where failure is part of it. Um, you learn from the failures. Don't let other people kind of discourage you if, if it's something that you want. It's, it's possible and you just have to, you have to put your full heart into it.